I need you, God. That's all I can say is I need you. Even if this was my last time, Lord, if you were to come tomorrow, Lord, I hope that I wouldn't preach any different. I hope that I wouldn't procrastinate as I do many other things in my life, Lord, being prepared for your coming and the seriousness of your word, Lord, and people's lives and what we are supposed to be doing here with our time. I need you desperately this morning. Take every thought, Lord, every attitude, every voice that would be against you and this message from your word in Jesus' name, taking it captive and making it obedient to your word, I ask you, Lord, help me in my thoughts. Touch the hearer this morning, break through. God, the religious heart, the heart hardened by sin, by your conviction, Father, not my words, but your spirit and your word. Bring us who have become complacent in areas out of complacency and back into a first love lifestyle, Lord. Please, God, I ask you, I supplicate to you this morning in front of these people, laying aside my image, my self-image, my self-esteem, they're all emptiness in comparison to your glory. So use me one more time this morning in Jesus' name. Okay, um, is Marsha back? Where's Marsha? Cheever, is she here? No? She's praying anyway. All right, I'm going to read chapter five. You can stay seated this morning. I'm going to give you a break. But stay awake. If you start nodding off, I'll tell you to stand up. <laughs> it's only 30, it's like 31 verses. It's fine. Many years later, King Belshazzar gave a great feast for a thousand of his nobles, and he drank wine with them. When Belshazzar was drinking the wine, he gave orders to bring in the gold and silver cups that his pre predecessor, Nebuchadnezzar, had taken from the temple in Jerusalem. He wanted to drink from them with his nobles, his wives, and his concubines. So he brought these gold cups taken from the temple, the house of God in Jerusalem. And the king and his nobles, his wives, and his concubines drank from them. While they drank from them, they praised their idols made of gold, silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Suddenly, they saw the fingers of a human hand writing on the plaster wall of the king's palace near the lampstand. The king himself saw the hand as it wrote, and his face turned pale with fright. His knees knocked together in fear, and his legs gave way beneath him. The king shouted for the enchanters, astrologers, and fortune tellers to be brought before him. He said to these wise men of Babylon, whoever can read this writing and tell me what it means will be dressed in purple robes of royal honor and will have a gold chain placed around his neck. He will become the third highest ruler in the kingdom. But when all the king's wise men had come in, none of them could read the writing or tell him what it meant. So the king grew even more alarmed and his face turned pale. His nobles too were shaken. But when the queen mother heard what was happening, she hurried to the banquet hall. She said to Belshazzar, Long live the king, don't be so pale and frightened. There is a man in your kingdom who has within him the spirit of the holy gods. During Nebuchadnezzar's reign, this man was found to have insight, understanding, and wisdom like that of the gods. Your predecessor, the king, your predecessor, King Nebuchadnezzar, made him chief over all the magicians, enchanters, astrologers, and fortune tellers of Babylon. This man, Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar, has exceptional ability and is filled with divine knowledge and understanding. He can interpret dreams, explain riddles, and solve difficult problems. Call for Daniel, and he will tell you what the writing means. So Daniel was brought in before the king. The king asked him, 
Are you Daniel, one of the exiles brought from Judah by my predecessor, King Nebuchadnezzar? I've heard that you have the spirit of the gods within you, and you are filled with insight, understanding, and wisdom. My wise men and enchanters have tried to read the words on the wall and tell me their meaning, but they can't do it. I, told, I am told that you can give interpretations and solve difficult problems. If you can read these words and tell me their meaning, you will be clothed with purple robes of honor, royal honor, and you will have a gold chain placed around your neck. You'll become the third highest ruler in the kingdom. Daniel answered, keep your gifts or give them to someone else, but I'll tell you what the writing means. Your majesty, the most high God, gave sovereignty, majesty, glory, and honor to your predecessor, Nebuchadnezzar. He made him so great that people of all races and nations and language trembled before him in fear. He killed those who wanted to kill and spared those he wanted to spare. He honored those he wanted to honor and disgraced those he wanted to disgrace. But when his heart and mind were puffed up with arrogance, he was brought down from his royal throne and stripped of his glory. He was driven from human society. He was given the mind of a wild animal and he lived among the wild donkeys. He ate grass like a cow and was drenched with the dew of heaven until he learned that the Most High God rules over the kingdoms of the world and appoints anyone he desires to rule over them. You are his successor, O Belshazzar, and you knew all this, yet you have not humbled yourself, for you have proudly defied the Lord of heaven and have had these cups from his temple brought before you. You and your nobles and your wives and concubines have been drinking wine from them and praising gods of silver, gold, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Gods that neither see nor hear nor know anything at all. But you have not honored the God who gives you the breath of life and controls your destiny. So God has sent his hand, this hand, to write the message. <coughs> Sophia, please get me water. This is, <coughs> excuse me, this is a message that was written. Meeny, meeny, tekel, and parson. This is what the words mean. Meaning means numbered. God has numbered the days of your reign and has brought it to an end. Tekel means weighed. You have been weighed on the balances and have not measured up. Parson means divided. Your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Then at Belshazzar's command, Daniel was dressed in purple robes. A gold chain was hung around his neck, and he was proclaimed the third highest ruler in the kingdom. That very night, Belshazzar, the Babylonian king, was killed, and Darius the Mede took over the kingdom at the age of 62. This narrative takes place on the night in history that Babylon was being seized by the Persians, so around 539 B.C., Nebuchadnezzar already passed away. Remember his encounter with God. Little chain of events afterwards. His son, evil Merodach, ruled for two years. Then he was murdered by his brother-in-law, who was succeeded by his son, who was assassinated by King Nobonidus who restored many of the deteriorating Babylonian temples at that point. I guess they weren't being used, and now he's restoring this. So Nabonidus and his son, who is Belshazzar, were the rulers now. He was a co-regent or a co-ruler, uh, Belshazzar, so his dad was off doing some other stuff, and he was ruling this, this part. Belshazzar, the name, means Bel protect the king. Remember, Bel was the chief god of the Babylonians. The god of thunder, not Thor, or whatever your Hollywood tells you. And Bel is also a common name for, for Baal, which is the fertility god of the Canaanites, just fun fact. It's ironic that his name means that 
He was named after a false god protecting the king because he dies in the end. So there's, there's irony there, and that's because it was a false protection. It comes from a sense of false security, which would be a major theme in this chapter. All the comforts and prosperity of Babylon, just as in our world system today, in the end offer us no protection. That's what I Thank you, sweetheart. when we come face to face with the judgment of God. So Belshazzar's hosting this wild party. Probably to help boost morale, distract people from what's really going on. They were aware that they were being invaded. They had people on the outside but they were encouraging people to party and drink anyway. Because they were arrogant, they had some of the most fortified walls in any empire. They had ancient bunkers full of supplies, storehouses of food that could last them for many, many years. They were protected. They were secure in their protection. They had nothing to worry about, so they thought. Obviously, this is reminiscent of the world today that we live in, and how it is and how it will be as we rapidly, we are rapidly approaching, probably quicker than you think, the end. 1 Thessalonians 5.3, for you are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and security, destruction will come upon them suddenly like labor pains on a pregnant woman and they will not escape. Similar to how it was in the days of Noah, humanity has continually been stubborn and hard of hearing concerning the warnings of God. And we revert, our nature is to revert to trusting in our own security our own progress, our own material things. This picture of this party reminds me of a modern day thing. It reminds me of many wealthy people today in the instability of our world system, where we're headed. We have wars, literal wars going on which you're desensitized from because you're in America right now and we're not technically in the midst of war. You know what I mean? When it's happening far away, you're, you're detached. I wouldn't say desensitized, disassociated from it. You see it through the lens of the media. We have political chaos everywhere. We have economic instability everywhere. And in the midst of this, what is happening, there are tech billionaires buying up the most luxurious bunkers you could imagine. Oh yeah. They're hiring military security in these bunkers and these places to survive a societal collapse that ironically they help create in a sense. They're trusting in their own power to save them in the end. Or like we we heard a a few weeks ago from from Mr. Musk seeking to colonize other planets because we have to preserve humankind as if it's our duty, as if it's our responsibility and not God's. When in the end, the story's already written. We have the writing to inform us of what is going to happen. It is the fear of the Lord That is what is lacking today, ladies and gentlemen. From the youth all the way up. It is the awe of who God is, what he can and will do, what he has done. The fear and the awe of that that's lacking today. 
It's dissolved in a sea of distraction. It's dissolved in busyness. People running to and fro as if our lives and our provision is all that matters. What a picture of our times here in this short chapter in Daniel. Also, the misuse of what God has deemed holy. What God has meant to be set apart. Belshazzar's audacity, arrogant audacity to take holy vessels stolen from Israel, dedicated to the Jerusalem temple and God, and drink out of them. So he's basically saying, look at our, look at our past victories. They got that in their victory. And these, th- their God, obviously, is nothing. So we'll drink out of them, which is technically a physical act of blasphemy, I would say. And in the midst of that moment, it was that moment, it was like, that's okay, that's enough. This is it. This is what's going to happen. Because he showed how he had forgotten. (laughs) Excuse me, the power of God that humbled Nebuchadnezzar, his his grandfather, says father, but they're talking about grandfather. The God that made him into an animal I mean, his mind, right? Everybody knew this. It wasn't a myth. It wasn't a legend. It was, it was pretty recent. He forgot. He forgot about that God, and he said, let's party with our own gods. And their own gods, like modern-day gods, tell us we can do whatever we want, We can make our own destiny. We can build our own security. We can have our own supply. All of this, Jesus warns about now. But God was already warning people all the way back in Daniel's day. And even today, many will not listen or understand. Because this is, this is, today, today, this is the feeling, right? The feeling this is, this is too heavy for a Sunday pastor. Come on. I'm serious. This is the spiritual sense that I have and many pastors are challenged with, do we water this down to just make people feel better or do we warn them? And, and we are, we're here to equip, yes, encourage, of course, but warning is part of this. And this is a big part of Daniel. So I'd be robbing the book and robbing God and sinning against God by not doing this. But many aren't listening. And that includes not just unbelievers but professing Christians in 2023 because they're still building their lives on the things of Babylon because they have forgotten God and the fear of God and they have left their first love. Luke 12, 15, then he said, beware, guard against every kind of greed. Life is not measured by how much you own. Maybe I'm gonna stop and I'm gonna rewind and I'm gonna read that last sentence again. Life is not measured by how much you own. Life is not measured by your job performance and your career and going up the ladder. Then he told them a story. A rich man had a fertile farm that produced fine crops. He said to himself, what should I do? I don't have room for all of my crops. Then he said, I know, I'll I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones and I'll have room enough to store all my wheat, wheat and other goods. I'll sit back and say to myself, my friend, you have enough stored away for years to come. Now take it easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool. You will die this very night. Then who will get everything you worked for? Yes, a person is a fool to store up earthly wealth, 
but not have a, reli- uh, a, a rich relationship with God. Do you see the connection to Daniel? There are some in this room, you are storing up for yourselves, still, as a believer, riches, storehouses in this world. And God is saying, I'm coming. And you're going to lose it all because you've been trusting in this stuff. Are you hearing me, ladies and gentlemen? Now, if, if, if my, my mind is in tune with the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit is convicting right now, and I don't even have to go any further. It's his job. But you also have to listen. Obviously, Belshazzar was that kind of fool. He had no rich relationship with God. What was his relationship with? Well, riches in Babylon. It only took a few leadership changes after his grandfather for the family to start trusting in their own security. Again, you think that would have been a huge wake-up call with Nebuchadnezzar. Wow. It only takes a few moments for us to forget God. It only takes a few moments when you walk out of this sanctuary to forget God. Be aware of that this morning. Me too. That's why it takes a work. That's why it's not easy. That's why it's a narrow path. If you wanted it easy, Christianity should be your last choice. There's a lot of easier religions that you can earn spirituality a whole different way. It's empty in the end, of course, it's nothing. But if you want it easy, it's not it. You are constantly gonna be assaulted with reasons and ways to forget God when you are not in the church setting. And that's because the same spiritual Babylon, remember the Babylonian system, this is a spiritual system. We're exposed to it on a daily basis. It's all around us. It's in pop-up ads. It's in emails. It's in text messages. It's through media. And it's, it's, it's in the influence of our own heart. If we're not careful, we're going to forget the warnings of Scripture easily and we'll be out of tune with the Spirit of God. It cannot be a Sunday-only thing. It cannot be a, you put in your five years and you're done thing. It's not an effort thing. Or we are going to fall away much like these Babylonians. So here in this wicked moment, They're using the holy things of God now for blasphemy. Wake up call, and it's judgment night now. What God had already said came to pass. It was going, there was nothing that was going to stop Babylon falling because God already predicted it, prophesied it. It was going to happen. And just to make sure we all understand. God chose to have Daniel chapter 5 written. He chose to have this account here for us to read to warn us. Now, he has done that supernaturally, miraculously, over and over again. He has warned humanity to return to him. When we say humanity, I want to get out of your minds if you think that I'm just talking about unbelievers and pagans. Over and over, God has warned his people to return to him, even while they still believed in him. From Adam and Eve to Abraham and Lot to the good and the evil kings, God has always spoken. He spoke through burning bushes, through signs and wonders. Man, we're stubborn. And now here's a unique way to speak through a human hand appearing out of nowhere near a candlelight to write judgment on the wall while everybody witnessed. How do you, how would you deal with that, guys? I mean, I know we got like, I think we have holograms now, right? Are we to that level? You'd probably say, oh, he he must be projecting it from back there. I think of like Hollywood, like, what is that hand from the, the movie? 
Ad, was it Adam's family? You know what I'm talking about? Thing, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Freaky. This isn't that. This isn't a cartoon. This was, this was a silent and fearful moment, and it was in a judgment miracle. So the party stops. People stop drinking. They probably got that moment, and you who used to drink know what I'm talking about, right? Where you like sober up real quick. Whoa, this is scary. And that intoxication is gone because you are just, everybody was freaked out. They saw a hand appear out of nowhere. And it's writing. Yeah. And this is where we get the idiom. This is where we get the phrase. I had just heard it on, I heard it on a, a news station. I think it was on the radio. And the newscaster was saying, yeah, they haven't read the read it writing on the wall. And I'm like, oh, yeah, see, we use that all the time now. Which culture is really belittled into a joke about impending doom. It's an idiom. It means doom is coming. It's coming from this book of the Bible. It's a shame that we have degraded this powerful warning of Scripture when we understand what it really means. If, if I Googled, if you Google, now some Google, the, it's, it's subjective if you're logged in on a computer, but for the most part, I think if you all Googled where does the writings on the wall come from or what does writings on the wall mean or the writing on the wall? For me, the title of a Sam Smith video came up. Sam Smith, one of his greatest Oscar-winning songs is called Writings on the Wall. A talented singer, but one who is in the depths of sin. His message is anti-Christ, whether he knows it or not. I don't know his history. I don't know his background. And make no mistake, his music is leading our youth astray in his lifestyle that is twisted and Babylonian. That is what he's influenced by. He took a phrase from the Bible, whether he knew it or not, and he made it about a worldly, it's a lustful relationship, a worldly song to gain wealth off of. This is the world we live in, ladies and gentlemen. We don't take it seriously enough, though. Because you'll be like, oh, it's Sam Smith. You know, it's not going to harm anyone. The spirit of the man is corrupted. His message is to confuse, especially our youth, into an already confused identity because of the Babylonian system we live in. And now we're taking scripture and twisting it. Many other examples I, I could give, but I don't, you know, I don't want to make you feel too bad if you've caught a Sam Smith song on the radio, right? Taking the holy things of God, twisting them into the vanity and idolatry of man's use for human purposes. Listen, humanity hasn't changed much. And guess what? Judgment is still coming. But it's not just for one empire. It's not just for one city. One, you know, it's not just for America. It's not just for Canada. It, it's going to be for the entire world. And guess what? Sam Smith He's going to have to have a wake-up call from God Almighty, as all of us will. We're going to have to wake up. We're going to have to face God one day. So this phrase, the writings on the wall, should not be relegated into a worldly lust song. The phrase should bring us to our knees and really have us tremble as Belshazzar and his, cr his crew, his party crew, as they saw that hand appear and write words. And this, this was a scene that's scarier than the scariest horror movie. There was dead silence. And they couldn't figure out the meaning. Now they would understand the, the words, but they don't understand what, 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 is it, what does this mean? So what do they need? They need an interpreter. Of course they do. Just like his grandpa, he makes the same mistake. You would think he would have called Daniel first. No. Who does he call on again? He calls on Harry Potter and his cronies. 
And he calls on Oprah, and I'll add in there Tyler Henry. That's who he calls in. That's who we're going to get to help us out because they, they couldn't figure it out. They were, they were just freaked out by all of this hand appearing in the middle of our party. So a voice of reason comes from the queen because they, they couldn't. They could do nothing. They, they were just as freaked out. They were powerless. Queen comes in. The mom comes in. She remembers. There's always somebody who remembers. Hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. There's this guy, Daniel, and he, he has the spirit of God in him. Now, she said the spirit of the gods, but if she knew better, she would really say, in our modern Christianity, she would say, oh, I'm going to find somebody who's full of the Holy Spirit. That's what she was saying. Daniel's around 80 years old by now. He's around uh, um, Harrison Ford's age, okay? Man, that's... He's running around doing Indiana Jones movies. Who are we to retire? <laughs> Judy Taylor would be right there with him. I don't know if she's 80 yet, but Judy Taylor, Harrison Ford, two strong people. Jim Taylor, too. Awesome, guys. Thanks. Thanks for giving us hope. Um, so Daniel did what he does because... How can Daniel just come in and interpret writing? I mean, how could he do that? He had maintained his dedication to the Lord all this time, all the years of his life. He's not a perfect man. No one's perfect, right? But Daniel's life proves that we can be dedicated to service to the king of kings, even in the midst of a world like Babylon. We are meant also to be spokespersons and interpreters of the mysteries of heaven to a world system that's partying, basically. Matthew 13, 11. We are meant to be ambassadors, representatives for Christ in a fallen world that is all around us that's about to be judged. 2 Corinthians 5.20. And then our world is in its last night, you could say that. It's under siege and it's about to fall. The hour, actually, the hour is already here. The hour is already here, John 16.32. So my question is, how are we going to warn, how are you youth going to warn in your schools or whoever your influence is, it, it, I mean, how are you going to warn the world about what is going to happen if you yourself are involved in the party? Do you know what I mean? Daniel was not with them at the party. Daniel was not drinking. I'm not doing the alcohol debate, but I'm just saying he wasn't getting wasted. He was prayed up. He was in his word. He was prepared in and out of season to hear from God and speak for God. You, you can't, you're not going to forsake every entertainment in the world. You're not going to forsake everything that's not spiritual, right? <clears throat> but you can live your life in such a way that you're ready to go because he's your first love. In this moment now, he spoke about, well, he spoke the judgment of God, and it's a very simple but serious translation. Easily and prophetically applies to us now. This isn't, you don't need a, you don't need a master's degree in theology to figure this stuff out, guys. Meaning, meaning. Many, many. Meaning numbered from the Aramaic word to count silver. That's all it is. Counting silver in the Aramaic. For Belshazzar and Babylon, the days were numbered that night. The kingdom would fall and he would die. It was going to happen, already appointed. There's no repentance for him. It's over. That's it. He's judged. Well, how does that apply to us? That's, that's depressing. Well, 
For us, our days are numbered as well. The time that we have. The time that we have. The time that we have that we elevate as so precious. I think we've made time an idol without even realizing it. I, I, I was aware of it this morning in the prayer room. We have a clock in there that ticks really loud. How much time do I have left? How much time can I give you? How busy am I? it's, it's, It's actually God's time that he created, and we've made it our time. Because it hasn't changed. What It's 2023. Hasn't changed, I don't know, the past 10 years. It's only escalated. For all of us, right? The number one response when you ask how someone's doing is busy. Correct me if I'm wrong. I'm just, maybe that's just my opinion. How many are really busy? You can raise your hand, it's okay. You're busy, you got a lot to do. You got, you don't have that much time. We need to get back to the word for this. Job 14.5, our time that we elevate that's so precious is numbered. You have decided the length of our lives. You know how many months we will live, and we are not given a minute longer. Wow, that's, that's hardcore. James 4.14, how do you know what your life will be like tomorrow? Your life is like a morning fog. It's here a little while, and then it's gone. Psalm 39, 4, Lord, remind me, Lord, the psalmist is saying, remind me, Lord, because I need to be reminded how brief my time on earth will be. Remind me that my days are numbered, how fleeting my life is. So you see the psalmist with his struggle, right, claiming his time is his own, but then in verse 5, he goes into, well, you have made my life no longer than the width of my hand. My entire lifetime is just a moment to you. At best, each of us is but a breath. Like Belshazzar, when we live like it is about our pleasure and our party, we're living like we will live forever, but the reality is all of it is passing away and our days are numbered, and we have to live in that perspective now. There is a heaven and eternity that is accounting for every second of our brief lives here. Our days are numbered. The next word is telel in the Aramaic. That simply means weighed. So Belshazzar was already judged at that moment. Weighed, picture scales. He was found deficient in comparison to the holiness of God. He was judged. Weighed on the scales of God's righteousness. He profaned God's vessels. He promoted the idolatry of trusting in riches, trusting in the wealth of this world, and the false security over the one true God's eternal reign and rule. Now, we are also going to be weighed We are going to, it's already started actually, we're going to be held accountable against the righteousness of God. Our actions, our thoughts, how we spend our time, God Almighty will take all of this into an account, counting one day. Now, of course, for the believer, good news, the blood of Jesus, right? Because I can't, there's no way, I'm I'm going to fail. I've already failed. Technically, The blood of Jesus washes away unrighteousness in the eyes of God and we are forgiven. But guess what? That doesn't subtract the reality, dismiss the reality that as believers, we're gonna be held accountable for every 
idle word that we speak. Matthew 12, 36, and I tell you this, you must give an account on judgment day for every idle word you speak. The words you say will either acquit you or condemn you. Romans 14, 10, so why do you condemn another believer? Why do you look down on another believer? Remember, we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. So it's not just Belshazzar and the evil people. Yeah, I, I, I know a different judgment for the unbeliever, of course, but we're still gonna stand before God. I think we've grown to forget this. It's right here in the Bible. 2 Corinthians 5.10. <clears throat> For we must all stand before Christ to be judged. Wait, hold on. Let me, let me just read that again. For we must all stand before Christ to be judged. We will each receive whatever we deserve for the good or evil we have done in this earthly body. We have the warning with what to do with our numbered days and our soon to be and already being weighed time our words, and now, not these cups and vessels, right? We are the vessels, aren't we? We are the temples. We are called the temples of God, literally. The temple, yes, and the temples of God. 1 Corinthians 3.16, don't you realize that all of you together are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God lives in you? God will destroy anyone who destroys his temple. For God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. We are supposed to be set apart for the master's use. Because this world that we live in, that's knocking at the doors of your heart, every single day, the prince of the power of the air and his influence, here's what he wants to do. He wants to take you a vessel of honor meant to be used for the glory of God. He, God, his destiny is for you to be used for his glory as a holy vessel. He created you for that purpose. That's why we can in Christianese say, hey, God created you for a purpose. That's actually, theologically, it works out. It is true. In Christ, that's what you are meant to be. That's what you're meant to do. And this world, the influence, it's very subtle now, right? You don't have a Belshazzar, literally. You have like spiritual principalities and powers influencing people and, and working through that. It wants to take you, pick you up like a holy vessel of God that's supposed to be for his purposes and make you sacrilege. make you a violation of God's purposes. Do you see how this connects to our time now? This, the, the Babylonian system, this world, the influence, use Sam Smith as an example, right? Satan's plan for him is to profane him as a vessel for God. See, God's plan, probably worship leader. Satan's plan, what's going on right now? The reason that Satan wants to do that is because he himself is a violation. He himself is a sacrilege, a walking deformation of the destiny of God. Not, it's, not, it's not an opposite, it's not yin yang, it is just a distortion, a twisting. The Bible is very clear about this in the New Testament. We are the ones who have to set ourselves apart. And I really hope you can hear this this morning. You are the one responsible, Asia, TJ, Kevin, Roddy, Carol, John, Joyce, Dory, Calvin. I'm just randomly choosing names. But maybe it's not random. I don't know. Maybe you need to hear it. 
You are the ones responsible. I, Nicholas, am responsible for making my vessel a vessel of honor. It is no one else will wash you. Not dishonor. 2 Timothy 2.20, in a wealthy home, some utensils are made of gold and silver and some are made of wood and clay. The expensive utensils are used for special occasions and the cheap ones for everyday use. If you keep yourself pure, you will be a special utensil for honorable use. Your life will be clean and you will be ready for the master to use you for every good work, Daniel was ready. You see? He was ready to go. And he went in. If you keep yourself pure. Now, what does that mean? Are you talking about like mainline sins, like sexual immorality and, and you know, getting wasted every night and being addicted? To no, everything. It's the lore of distraction from you to even read and love the word of God. Some of you this morning, you're struggling so bad because you can't even read the Bible every day with fulfillment. Simply because of distraction. The weekly pull to get sucked into materialism and possessions and, and greed. Yes, the lust for knowledge and power. Knowledge, is a, it's a lust, it's out there. Because we're spoiled on knowledge now. We made machines to help us get knowledge faster, and now the machines are starting to tell us what knowledge we should have. It's twisted, man. Or even just the entertainment of this life. Yes, even just screen time. Yes, I'm going to warn you about screen time. Not to give you a mindfulness, new agey, healthy mental health thing going on, although it is horrible for your mental health but it's distracting you from the purposes of God. Whatever takes us away from making God our primary focus and mission, we have to be heavenly minded today because if we're not, then what are we? Then we're carnally minded and we're walking into death as the enemy is sieging, sieging, getting ready to seize our, wherever we are because he's gonna attack us and kill us. It's that serious. How do I know? Because the Bible says so in Romans 8, 6. To be carnally minded is death. To be spiritually minded is life and peace. Belshazzar and his party were the epitome, they were the epitome of being carnally minded. They forgot God. They, they, it's easy to forget God. They soaked in the lusts of the flesh and life in general, and God pronounced the final judgment is death knocked on the door. <clears throat> if we're not aware, our fate will be the same. Final word was Paris. Your kingdom has been divided. Now Babylon had been divided for a long time and it had to fall. But really that's every single kingdom that we have in our world today. It's divided. Every single kingdom of this world and humanity. We, we saw it in the prophetic dream, uh, the statue of Nebuchadnezzar. Remember that? Piano player, worship team, somebody, come up, please. And we see it in the end of Revelation. Are you guys still with me? Jesus said, Matthew 12, 25, Jesus knew their thoughts and replied, any kingdom divided by civil war is doomed. A town or family splintered by feuding will fall apart. And if Satan is casting out Satan, he is divided and fighting against himself. His own kingdom will not survive. Ironically, not ironically, but um, there's no harmony anyway in Satan's kingdom because it's a kingdom of darkness. And it's divided and it will fall. It, it has already been pronounced. It's going to happen. That's why we can't say, well, can't Satan just get saved? No, it's, it's done. He was like Belshazzar, his fate is sealed. The entire world system we live in is divided, ladies and gentlemen. It doesn't take a rocking scientist to see that. You can spend five minutes in a news feed after this service, and you will see how divided the world is, how twisted everything is. 
what could Belshazzar say to all this in the end? He just, I mean, it's over. It's, he didn't say anything. He said nothing. He gives Daniel the reward, like he said, even though Daniel didn't really want it. And then he's killed the very night, and it's over. Prophecy was fulfilled. Babylon fell. History and archaeologically, uh, confer, archaeology confirmed this happened. This is a real event. It happened. Daniel was thriving even in the midst of this turmoil. Do you see it? For our modern times, because he chose to follow God and, yes, he was filled with the Spirit of God. Not because of his position, not because of his great upbringing, not even because of his own happiness, because he forsook that. His life was prepared, his faith was uncompromising, and he did not have to be afraid of the writing on the wall. If you read the text, read it a few times, you will see no ungodly fear in Daniel when he came up in that room. Let's say the hand is still there, right? Or the writing's there. Daniel, do you think he came in? Oh, wait a minute, hold on. I, I gotta get my, I, this is what's happening here. No, he came in, I think he came in chill mode. Like, oh yeah, I'll interpret this. This is God. That's because he had no guilt and he had no shame and he had no ungodly sorrow. Those people were, were filled with the fear, the, the bad fear, the guilty fear. Daniel had already lived 80 years in the awe of God, and for that reason, he was aware of the reality of the eternity that we have and how short his life was. Daniel walked and was about the Father's business before Jesus even came on the scene preaching that. He was to be about his Father's business. And Daniel was a man known to be full of the Spirit, not of many gods as the, the pagans thought, but of the one true God. And he was able to interpret the writing on the wall. We are called to do the same. Where's the writing on the wall for us? Well, it's right here. It's this Bible. It's 66 books. No more, no less. 66 books. The manifest future and purpose for my life, for my wife's life, for my daughter's life, my kids, and everyone in this room. Your destiny, what, what is going to happen is written right here. The purpose for your life, why you wake up, why you breathe, how you were created, what's going to happen in the last days. You're not going to find it from anything else except the word of God. And the festivities that we have, the distractions around us, it's ungodliness, it's idolatry, it's rising. There will be more, I don't even have to be super prophetic to tell you this. There will be more pride in humanity's sin in the future than you have seen like ever before. It will be so blatant. I'm telling you this because the Bible says so, not me. I'm just transmitting the message, right? As the kingdom of modern Babylon folds in on itself, but there will still be a people in this world, they will call on people like you and you and you and you and you and me to say, hey, I know somebody who can interpret what's really going on. Because this looks really bad, but I need somebody who's filled with the Spirit who can interpret the writing on the wall. For humankind... Romans 10, 12, Jew and Gentile are the same in this respect. They have the same Lord who gives generously to all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Hallelujah. But how can they call on him to save unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they have never heard about him? How can they hear about him unless someone tells them? Someone like Daniel or you and me because we haven't been wasting our lives and we've been spending time with the Father every single day. And we, we, we come into that party of idolatry and immorality or whatever it is. People are going to turn to us and we're going to be able to do what Daniel did and say, listen, this is what's happening, okay? And, 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 and you still have a chance. 
You're not Belshazzar. There's Jesus now, and he died and he rose again to give you eternal life. What will you do now? Will you put down the vessel of dishonor and make it a vessel of honor in your own life and your own heart? Would you stand with me this morning? Come on. Very simple. God is calling you to be a Daniel, ladies and gentlemen. Whatever it is in your life, whatever it is in your life that has been distracting you, whether it's your job, whether it's your bank account, whether it's that relationship in codependency. Hey, I know all about codependency. Come spend five hours with me. I'll, t- I'll teach you about it. I- I'll convert the word for, for you. Ready? Codependency equals idolatry. And idolatry, it's the same for any other of those things that are distracting you because it's become an idol in your life and you have to tear it down and return to your first love because he has called you, not just the pastor, not just the people on the, on the, in, behind the pulpits, not just the Bible study teachers. He's called you to be a Daniel and a voice in this Babylonian system and generation. Will you be ready? The choice is yours. Would you close your eyes this morning? Thank you, Father. Holy Spirit, the same Spirit that filled Daniel to give him supernatural ability. Holy Spirit, the same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, the same Spirit that your word says, God, lives within us, is fully able to give us the power and the boldness that we need this morning. So I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would touch hearts in this place, that the conviction already brought would manifest in life change through our decisions as we leave here today. As we go off into festivities, Lord, to celebrate freedom of a nation, God, help us never to forget the first freedom that comes from the first love and that's freedom from sin and death and the power of hell in the grave. It's a message that we are called to proclaim in the name of Jesus Christ. Fill your people today, God. We ask you, Lord, to fill us. If that's you today, and I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands. We're closing, obviously. But you just ask him. You just ask him. It's a simple prayer. God, will you fill me today? Will you make yourself real in my life? Lord, forgive me, God, for the things that I've put in front of you this past week, for the distractions of the world, for the Babylon things that I've adapted into my own life. I want to lay them down, God. I want to lay down an hour of screen time and return to your word. An hour, uh, 10 minutes, 50, whatever it is. You have to pay the price. You have to count the cost this morning. So if that's you in the depths of your heart, you're already doing it. But it has to continue outside the four walls of this church because someone needs to hear the writing on the wall from a spokesperson or a spokesman or woman for the kingdom of God. Thank you, Lord. Bless your people today, God. Bless them as they leave here. Thank you for these precious lives that we have, Lord, and awaiting your coming and awaiting this great judgment, Lord. We have hope secured. We have a peace that we can rest in, and we have today the opportunity for repentance and to receive your mercy. We receive that today. Bless your people, God, in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Thank you for joining us. Have a great 4th of July weekend.